Hello and welcome, as they used to say on Games Master here in the UK. Show my age a little bit there, but I'm your host, Neil C. Hughes, and today I want to explore the transformative world of edtech, or education technology, because our guest is a distinguished entrepreneur, author, and the current CEO of Cypher Learning. His name is Graham Glass, and from pioneering an e-learning platform with EDU2, has amassed over a million users in just five years to innovating with AI-powered tools that revolutionise course creation and delivery. Graham's journey is nothing short of remarkable. So if you're a business or from the world of academia and you've got a course you need to create, imagine if AI could create a good 80% of that for you and the final 20% is you tweaking everything and getting everything bang on. This is what we're going to be talking about today. It is a real game changer and can save so much time. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to San Francisco where Graham is going to be sharing his journey and also sharing how he and his team are bringing the global education scene to life with technology. But enough from me. Let's get Graham on the show now. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah, I, I'd love to. And once again, you know, thank you so much for inviting me on, on your show, Neil. So I'm Graham Glass. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Cypher Learning. We provide a modern cloud-hosted learning platform. But tell you just a little bit about my background, as you may or may not be in a tough my accent, I grew up in the UK. I went to a really good school uh, around London area, so I was very lucky in that regard. Um, I've always been an entrepreneur, so I was writing software for doctors when I was 16 years old. So I've always enjoyed building cool things. Um, once I graduated with my uh, degree from University of Southampton in England, I came to UT Dallas to do my master's degree. And while I was at UT Dallas, in my nights, I was writing computer software, hoping to start another company. Um, but uh, during the daytime, they invited me and said, hey, would you like to start teaching computer science at UTD as a lecturer? And I had no educational background. I never taught anyone anything. And I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> and uh, I had a really good time. I was teaching all kinds of advanced software techniques and programming languages and analysis and design. So I really enjoyed it. And when I got my master's degree, then I started my first company in America, which was teaching this stuff uh, all over the US to companies like IBM, TI, et cetera. So that's where I got a lot of my teaching experience in higher ed and in business. But because of my entrepreneurial side, I ended up started building software companies. And we can talk a bit more about what I'm doing there later on the show. Can't wait to find out more about what you're doing. One of the things I always try and do early in the podcast is, is dive into the guest's origin story. And there seems to be a lot to unpack with yourself there, going from the, the UK to the US, your journey spanning from academia to pioneering advances in e-learning platforms. So I've got to ask, what inspired your transition from the academic world to entrepreneurship? And how do all these experiences feed into one another? Yeah, that's actually, I hadn't really thought about it too much until, <laughs> until I was preparing for your show. So the entrepreneurship actually came before the educational part, because I mentioned ever since I was a kid, I love to build things. Mm. And uh, at my first sort of entrepreneurial spirit, if you like, was building a medical software for a doctor in the UK while I was uh, finishing up my, my school and studying in university. And I really enjoyed building the software there. And I had high hopes to turn it into a company that I think I was going to call Computer Compute Clinic or something like that. So I've always really liked making money about building really you know cool things. But then I kind of suppressed that a little bit because I did want to get a degree and a, and a graduate degree. And so I, then I got pulled back into the entrepreneurial side when I realized that I could make a really good living by teaching everything that I learned at university, but teaching it in the world of business. Mm. So that's kind of like, the, it's always been that kind of push-pull between learning things and building things. And at the very core of Cypher Learning, that almost seems to be a dedication to human-focused experience design in training and education. It's so refreshing to hear in this field. So can you dive a little bit deeper into what that means and why it's so essential for the future of education in, in a digital age? Yeah, I'd love to. And, you know, a lot of what we do at Cypher Learning is driven by my own um, 
my own goals based on my own experiences and education. But I've got two young boys mm. and they're very cognizant of what kind of education experience do I want my boys to have? And I know when I started the company, I looked at the state of edtech and all the usual learning platforms out there. And I just thought they were miserable. Yeah. The user experience was miserable. It's like being hit in the, in the face with a cold fish. <laughs> so I wanted to build something that people really enjoyed from just a user experience. But just as importantly, I wanted to build a platform that could bring people together. Because in this world, it's an interesting one. Like the traditional way was you went to a university, you hang out with your friends, you did study groups, you socialized. It was really, really good fun. And most of my memories from university were like the fun social things. They're not like the dry, you know, reading some chapter in some database design. But we have to face the reality that more and more people are learning electronically. They're learning in the workplace. They're learning in the line of the pizza store. They're learning everywhere. So the question is, how do you bring ed tech into, the, into, the, into a way that brings people together? So for, I'll give you a simple example. If you have two people with the same learning goal on that platform, like they both say, I want to master digital branding, for example, then it will bring those people together so that they can learn together if they want to. So we don't force it, but anytime we see commonality, shared learning goals, we bring them together. Uh, but I'll just give you one other quick example because it is cool and different. So when COVID hit, more and more uh, people, whether it's uh, business or academia, were working from home. So you would log it into your platform, whatever it happens to be, in our case, Cypher Learning Platform. We wanted to make it felt like there was still something going on there, like there was a culture, there was a social thing. So we added this cool little thing that in all of your courses, and your tiles, when you log in, they will glow slightly and pulsate if there's things going on in there. So when you're logged in, you get a sense of there's action, there's activity, there's people there. And when you would go to a course, you would see a little scrolling widget that would show you all the things that all your friends were doing in the class right now. So there's just another example of trying to bring the human factor, the human connection, but into a state-of-the-art edtech platform. Incredibly cool. Absolutely love that. And of course, right now, especially in 2023, with the rise of Gen AI and machine learning, etc., there's a real pressure on everyone to be in a state of continuous learning, stay on top of those tech trends and business trends as well. And your profile, when I was looking you up, mentions a commitment to cultivating a perpetual learning culture. And in an age of rapid technological advancements, how does this notion of lifelong learning remain relevant? And can you expand on why individuals and organizations should be prioritizing it right now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's partly a matter of survival, to be honest with you. You know, I, I'm a technical CEO. Mm. And so part of what I have to do is I need to keep up with current trends in multiple dimensions, trends in e-learning, uh, trends in business, distributed business, trends in AI, et cetera. So I personally have to learn all the time, but I'm not the old one out. I'm just like the normal. Like if you're a software engineer, look at the, the state of AI right now. I mean, it's changing everything. If you're in marketing, if you look at the rise of social media and the way that you get people's attention, that's changing all the time. So pretty much you have to learn all the time, or otherwise you're just going to get left behind. And so a lot of the cycle learning mission is how do we allow people to learn things really quickly. And I don't think we're ever going to get to the matrix where you just jack in the back of your head and you learn how to fly helicopters in five minutes. But I think if you leverage AI, you really can speed up the way that people learn. And I know that we talk with quite a lot of um, higher ed institutions, and they are realizing that more and more people, they just don't get a degree and I'm out. Mm. And the higher ed institutions want them to keep coming back. Like, how can we offer a lifelong learning experience through some university versus just three years and then you're never a customer of ours again? So a lot of people are trying to think about, given the fact that we all pretty much know that we have to learn more and more faster and faster, how do all of these institutions remain relevant? That's such a good point. I never thought about it that way before. You know, uh, Traditionally, it is the three years and then you're done, then you're out, but that, that's no, no longer fit for <laughs> a world yeah, that we're living right. in now. And of course, the 
It is a tech podcast we're talking on here today, and everything, we have to mention AI at least once, and the recent introduction of the world's first AI-powered co-pilot for teachers and instructors by Cypher Learning is another significant milestone for you guys. So how does that revolutionise the whole course creation process, and what has been the initial feedback from educators that have used it as well? Because if we go back five, ten years, educators were quite cautious about this, but obviously that's changed now, right? Yeah, so so since it is a tech podcast, as you mentioned, Neil, mm-hmm. I'll do a little bit of background um, on, on myself. So I was one of these kids that I love Star Trek. Mm. I was in the UK, so I love Blake Seven. Oh. Now, yeah. Most of your listeners have never heard of Blake Seven. Quite <laughs> you should. It's actually really good. And there was this computer in the spaceship called Zen. And Zen had this big booming voice, and he was he was basically a co-pilot in Blake Seven. So when they got in trouble, they would say, Zen, what would you do? Zen, can you help out here? So I, I always thought I was a huge fan of Zen. And then there was a, an even bigger computer called Orac, but that's another matter. <laughs> so I've always loved AI. And when I first you know, had a vision for what cycle learning was going to be, it was all going to be based around a personalized learning and an AI. But when I started the company back in 2009, this, there wasn't really any practical AI that you could really you could really leverage. So we were kind of like, doing a lot of things uh, around the edges, so to speak, of automation and, and a little, maybe a little bit of video transcription, but nothing that you would say, yeah, that's definitely AI. But as you know, OpenAI, ChatGBT came with the C is like, wow, this is amazing stuff. And I, I still don't really think that most people understand the full potential of things like ChatGBT. Because mm. so much of the education community is still wrapped around plagiarism and essays and stuff. So what we did is we thought, well, we have a this vision called AI 360, which is how AI can help instructors, course creation, learners, managers, administration, administrators, basically anyone involved in, in, in our edtech platform. So we decided Copilot version one was going to focus on content creation. Copilot version two is going to focus on the learner, which is actually in some respects going to be more amazing. So when we start experimenting with these AI technologies, we thought, well, maybe you could just build a little course planner, like a little course outline, and then the instructor has to do all the rest of the work. So that was really, how can you build 5% of a course? And we did that, and we thought, wow, that was actually amazingly good. It's like it's done a really good job of planning a whole course and, and what competency you're going to learn, et cetera. So we thought, let's sort of take another step. You know, Maybe you can build some question banks. It's like, wow, it did a really good job of it. And it basically just cascaded until we got to the point where we can build almost an entire super sophisticated course using AI. Now, we don't say we build 100%. We say we build 80%. And based on all the reaction, because we've got a lot of uh, early access people, we are totally nailing the 80%. It does it amazingly good. We're talking about synthetic images, finding really good... Um, videos to insert, finding recommended images, really good table of contents, study guides, full content. I mean, you name it, it's, it's got it. So, um, so when we first got to the point where, wow, we can build 80% of a course in 10 minutes, wow. which is quite amazing. And the incremental cost to our user base is less than $10. So I'm just giving you a sense for the ROI. Like yeah, yeah. people typically spend fifty thousand dollars on a course. We could do it for eighty percent for ten bucks. But the thing that I actually experience more um, more from this is well, actually two things. First of all, every time you ask the AI to build a course, it builds it slightly differently, which is a huge feature because what it means is, as an instructional designer, you could build five versions of the same course in about fifteen minutes, and they're all slightly different. And then you can say, well, course number three is the one that really is the best. Like, that's the way I wanted to build it. And then at that point, you put in the work to personalize it, put in your own anecdotes, move things around, and then you've got the 100% of the course. So it brings kind of software agile development to the world of course design. The second thing, though, which I think is more profound is I'm a voracious learner. And every day towards the end of the day, I used to go to Google and say, I want to learn about particle physics. I want to learn about how do they brew whiskey. I want to learn about 
um, theories of gravity, you know, you name it. And what I started doing is build it using our own technology and say, build me a course on particle physics. Yeah. And 10 minutes later, I had an amazingly high quality course that is pulling in videos and images and content from you know the entire world in a really easy to digest fashion. So I start now, when I teach myself, I learn now through Copilot instead of through Google. Which is kind of like, that's quite profound. It's actually doing a better job of educating me by AI than I would have done myself just surfing. And that's one of the reasons we're about to start focusing on Copilot for learners, because we can take the experience that I'm already benefiting from and bring it to millions of learners around the world. And I suppose one of the things that we've got to bring up here is uh, there's been a lot of criticism for chat GPT in particular. It can lie to you convincingly and give you misinformation, and you may think that you've learned something, but it could be completely incorrect. When creating your platform with the Cypher Copilot, how do you get around that and ensuring that everything is fact-checked? Yeah, no, it's, this is funny. So the, the cynical part of me is like, humans lie to humans way more than AI lies to humans. Yeah. I mean, you just have to go to the news these days, and yeah. there's so much misinformation. And that's not coming from AIs, that's coming from other humans. Putting that aside, though, I would say that because, yeah, we are holding an AI to a, a higher standard than ourselves. Yeah. You know, I've, I've generated a lot of courses so far. And I know people talk about the hallucinations, but I've never actually seen any wrong information so far. And I'm, I'm generating courses on things that I'm already somewhat of an expert. I think if you asked it to, you know, give me um, quotes from legal cases, yeah, then you're starting to get into areas that the AI is probably going to fudge it more. But if you say, teach me about photosynthesis, it's not going to come up and say photosynthesis comes out of the ground in a, in a brown liquid, you know? Yeah. It's, like, it's not that dumb. So I think that as long as you steer away from expecting it to give you specific quotes and specific URLs, et cetera, then these hallucinations seem to be very, very rare. But the second part is for the course creation, which is the emphasis in Copilot 1, we don't say it generates 100% of the course. We say it generates 80%. So we're making the assumption that a domain expert, whether it's an instructor or someone you hire as a domain expert, is going to review this thing for accuracy before they actually start teaching it to thousands of people. Um, much like you would do the same if you were, if you were a, an instructional designer and you search in Google, I'm not going to trust everything that, I, well, this is wrong. Well, I put it into Google, so it must be right. So, yeah. so um, but it's a huge accelerant though. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing about it is that we all have to realize that we're only less than a year into ChatGBT, mm. at least the 3.5 and plus. And if you look at what OpenAI and anthropomorph, Anthropomorphic and all the others are doing, they're going to get hallucinations down. They're not going to completely eliminate them, but they're going to get better. It's going to get more accurate. It's going to get more timely. So, you know, I don't want to be everyone clutching their pearls over a couple of very early things because it really is going to get way better over the next year or so. Yeah, completely agree with you. Now, I guess that the key is in the title there, co-pilot. It's a combination of that doing the heavy lifting and your own human expertise. So that's where the the magic happens. And I'm curious, because I, when I was looking you up, I see your biggest customers are obviously businesses, academia, et cetera. But if there are any solopreneurs or anybody or entrepreneurs that have got ideas in the head, got knowledge in the head, they want to create their own courses, do you serve these people as well? Yeah, we actually have, we have a product which is Cypher for Entrepreneurs, which is really focused on individuals who want to package their knowledge and sell it to other individuals. So it's it's a, um, it doesn't have Copilot, for example. It's not the full feature, and it's not our flagship product. Um, it's a simplified version of it, which is much more suitable for for individuals. And you know, I wish I had had it myself because I used to teach um, Unix and C, which is a used to be a very uh, important subject at, at university, and I got really good at it. And if I'd been able to create a course and sell it to hundred thousand people. You know, probably be retired by now. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what I was thinking because there's so many different people out there that've got individual areas of expertise, and anyone that's gone to those traditional uh, places of creating a course, it can be very long-winded. So it would be yeah. a huge tool, so one to watch closely. And of course, 
gamified courses, uh, they've been a big buzzword in recent years too. But from looking at what you, you're doing here, you seem to be pushing the envelope with this AI-driven approach. So can you tell me a bit more about how gamification, when combined with AI, can lead to a, a more truly personalized learning experience? Because that's what people are, are starting to expect now, aren't they? Yeah, no, I, and there's a very interesting backstory. It seems like everything's got a backstory <laughs> on gamification because, um, you know, I think it was about five years ago and we started hearing about gamification. I was learning about it. And I was also looking about different kinds of gamification because gamification is just a concept. It's not a specific set of things you have to implement. So we noticed that there were some platforms that they would say, we're gamified, but all that really meant was at the end of a course, you get a badge. whoop de doo um, There'd be other platforms where, where you get points and at the end you can cash in the points and buy something. But if you look at like world-class gamification, the general idea is you have levels. So it might be I'm a novice, I'm an intermediate, or if you make it fun, you could be I'm a digital enthusiast, I'm an ex, you know expert hacker. You can come up with really fun levels. And each level you have to get accumulate a certain number of points. And when you achieve a certain level, then different things can happen. Like you get to this level and you get some bonus points. You get to this level, get a badge. You get this level, you get a personalized pop-up. Congratulations. So you can trigger different things. And then how you get those points um, can be very varied. So you might be, when you enroll in the course, you get 20 points. When you finish the first lesson, you get 100 points. If you get over 90% in this quiz, you get another 1,000 points and a badge. So ideally what you want to do as an educator is to make your courses surprising, delightful, engaging. You sprinkle this gamification fairy dust all over your course so that in learners are really incented and have fun. And fun is really the key part. And when we, so I, we started working on this, we came up with a very cool generalized way to implement world-class gamification. And it was a big question, Mark, who is going to like this the most? Because we've got some customers in K-12, some customers in the higher ed, and some customers in business. So you intuitively feel, because it's called gamification, that it would be the kids who would like it the most. And it's actually completely opposite. So businesses are by far the biggest users of gamification, followed by higher ed, followed by K-12. Mm. So K-12 honestly tend to be the laggards in the education spectrum. Whereas businesses, they don't have so much legacy stuff they have to deal with. They're always like, what do I do that's most efficient, that keeps my learners the most engaged? So one of our customers is the country of Qatar. Mm. The entire country, their K-12 system, is on the Cypher platform. And the country of Qatar is really into modern learning. They're great. So they wanted, they wanted to gamify the entire country. So they did. So there's hundreds of thousands of people who get points and badges not just the learners, but the instructors as well, the teachers. So if you build a great course or you share something with other teachers, then you get points as well. So here it is. It really works. It's They got like a 30% plus engagement rate. It's a lot more fun. We've got, we've got anecdotal tales of students waking up in the middle of the night and finishing their essay the first so they could get those extra 100 points and then take a screenshot of them as number one on the leaderboard and sharing with their friends. But the, but the one downside of this thing, it does take a little bit more effort. Now, to create a game is easy. It's like a couple of minutes. But then you have to say, well, I want this action to occur at this point in my course, this action to occur in this course. So what we did with Copilot version one is to use AI to automatically build games as well. So if you want to build a course with all the competencies, all the quizzes, all the essay questions, all the project assignments, the gamification, the automation, everything, that it's, it's 10 minutes to build the whole thing. And so I think that AI, part of what AI does for us is it takes our more advanced features and makes them super easy to use for everyone who uses our system. Wow, absolutely incredible. And although there has been so many big advancements in e-learning, I'm curious, what challenges do you believe still exist in the industry? And then how are you attempting to address them with uh, your technology? Well, I'd say, you know, I think there's a general issue in the education industry in general, <laughs> independent of AI. Yeah. So I think, I think people are not taught in the most efficient way. 
And, uh, you know, it's, it's the typical story. Some kids get bored, some kids get left behind. Um, they're learning things that really don't make that much sense for our day and age. You know, like yeah. if you're, if you've got 40 hours a week, let's just say, let's use those 40 hours in a really efficient, concentrated way. And I'm not one of those people, by the way, who says all we should ever learn is things for your job. I'm not that way at all. Like I teach my boys all kinds of really fun things. But I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time teaching them about like advanced linear algebra or something unless I thought that was the direction of their career. But I would spend more time teaching them entrepreneurship and how to start your own business or personal finance because so, a lot of those things trip people up. So I think there is a, there is a general issue um, in, say, in K-12 about what you teach and how you teach it. But I think more broadly, I think that even within corporations as well, there's a high, big desire for uh, instant learning. So for example, let's just say I'm in tech support, I'm dealing with a difficult customer, and I'm not sure how to handle it. So here's the question. Do you want to, A, go and type in to a little box that says, what do you want to learn? And just say, how do I deal with a difficult customer? And 30 seconds later, I have this instant concentrated tutorial along with links to associated courses. Or do I want to go and Google and quickly do it and hope I find a video on it, or do I want to try and find some four-hour course on, you know, Udemy on how to deal with this? Yeah. And the obvious answer is I want it instant. So I would say that, you know, the the problem that we're trying to tackle, you know, is a big focus is how do you get to instant learning everywhere? Corporations, higher ed, K through 12, so that the time difference between when you want to know something and when you understand it is brought really, really small. And I'm now going to ask you to look into your virtual crystal ball here. So what's the worst that could happen? Well, there are so many technologies now from AI to AR and VR, of course, all becoming integrated into education. How do you envision the future of learning and indeed training in corporate environments throughout the next decade? Because I would imagine things are going to get moving pretty quickly, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, so I think that the potential is going to be amazing. Yeah. And the kind of educational experiences that are possible are actually fairly fairly apparent if you just look, as you mentioned, you look at AR, VR, Apple is now making this technology a lot more user-friendly. And you know Apple, you know, this is version one. By version five, it's going to be plugged into your contact lenses and, you know, whatever else. Yeah. So, so the kind of future that I would like my boys would be where, wherever they are, they'll just be able to say, hey, I want to learn about this. Uh, you know, black holes or something, and then instantly they they're floating in space. They can see black holes. They can ask questions. They'll get these disembodied, or maybe some to some AI character teaching them about it. If and, and it'll you know teach them based on what the AI knows they already know. So they're they're not just bringing up weird stuff as it goes. I mean, fully immersive, extremely memorable, engaging all of your senses, personalized. All of that is definitely going to be possible. And we're talking about a few years time here. I mean, we're not talking about 20 years. We're 10 years maximum, more likely to be five years. Yeah. And the, the, the tougher question is, well, who is going to embrace that? And who's going to fight against it? Yeah. So you're like, is K-12 going to embrace that? I doubt it. I mean, it would be nice if they did. Yeah. Businesses will embrace it. So it's, it's really, and I would embrace it as a parent. Like, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure my kids have access to all of this stuff because it just makes learning super fun. Incredibly cool. And you're incredibly passionate about this subject and the space, but also you've got a, a huge entrepreneurial spirit from within that I can hear just talking to you today. So given your vast experience and multiple successful ventures in the ed tech space, what advice would you give to a young entrepreneur that could be listening anywhere in the world, looking to make a difference in ed in education through technology? Any advice that you would pass down to them? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, being an entrepreneur is really good fun and it's also pretty tough. Mm. So you have to have a little bit of a thick skin and you have to be quite resilient. Um, and to get through the moments that are tough, you have to be really passionate about whatever you do. So, you know, pretty much everything that I've ever done as an entrepreneur is because I was really passionate about it and I didn't want to wait for somebody else to do it. Mm. And so if it's just like, well, I can do this to make money, 
the first time you hit a brick wall, you're probably just going to say, you know, is it worth it? I'll just get, you know, I'll just get a regular job. But I would say if you're really passionate about something and you get good at it and you put in the hours and you are realistic because you are going to have hard times as well, then I would say, go for it. Don't wait. Um, and, you know, the first time you might fail, but you learn a lot and then you try it again and then you try it again. And at some point you're going to succeed. Fantastic advice. I cannot thank you enough for coming on here today and sharing your invaluable insights. But before I let you go, I'm going to see if there's something we can do for you here because some of the biggest names in business, VC funding and tech have either been guests or maybe even listened to this podcast. So if I was to say, is that a person that you'd love to have private a private breakfast or lunch with? Who would it be and why? Because he or she might just be listening to this and let's see what we can manifest together on a podcast on a a Monday yeah. afternoon. Yeah, I mean that would be amazing. So, when you when you asked me that question, one person instantly sprung to mind, and this particular person is a big hero of mine. So I read their book recently, and it was just blew me away. Just amazing person. This person I know is also passionate about education, both in their business, but also in their foundation, because this person and his wife. Um, is a, a fantastic philanthropist and really into ed tech. And thirdly, Cypher Learning already, already has a global partnership with his company. Wow. Although this person may not know about me or Cypher Learning, we're actually doing business together all over the world. And that person is Michael Dell. Oh. Michael, if you are listening, I would love to meet with you because the stuff that we're doing with the AI would blow your mind. And I would love to do some bigger things together. Wow, what a great answer. Well, we'll send that out into the universe. Let's see what we can make happen together there. All I ask is if he does contact you, let me know and uh, we can Will do. share that story with everyone. And for anyone listening, just wanting to find out more information about everything we've talked about from the AI co-pilot and the, the work you're doing there, what's the best starting point for everything? And equally, if people have got any questions they want to ask your team. Yeah, so I would say as far as Cypher Learning goes, go to our website. It's a really nice website. And that's www.cypherlearning.com. And that's C-Y-P-H-E-R, Cypher Learning. Because Cypher is all about unlocking things. So it's unlocking the human potential. And, and as far as me personally, especially if your name happens to be Michael Dell, <laughs> you can just go to LinkedIn Learning and search for Grand Glass and you can send me a message there. Fantastic. Well, I always say at the end of every episode that technology works best when it brings people together. And I love what you're Absolutely. doing here, which is essentially building a world where lifelong learners find joy in perpetual learning uh, and also making it making them and their organizations more productive, more competitive. Incredibly cool what you're doing here and making it fun, which is the most important thing. But just thank you for sharing that story today. Uh, Thanks for joining me. And also a big shout out to Michael Dell. That's the third mention we're going to throw into the early <laughs> thank so Thanks, much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Wow, what an enlightening conversation there with Graham Glass of Cypher Learning. Today, I think we journeyed through that transformative world of ed tech, understood the, obtained a greater understanding of the importance of human-focused design combined with the game-changing potential of AI in creating personalised learning experiences. And from Graham's transition from the academic world to entrepreneurship to the revolutionary co-pilot platform that actually crafts a majority of a course in mere minutes. Incredibly exciting. I think the future of learning appears incredibly bright, interactive and profoundly impactful. And for anyone eager to explore more or reach out to Graham and his team, we'll have all the links in the show notes. As always, you can go to my website, techblogwriter.co.uk, go to podcasts, you'll find two and a half thousand interviews on there and links to everything. And remember, in our rapidly evolving tech landscape, for me, it's conversations like this every single day that help us navigate and better understand the shifts rather than fear them. But a big thank you to Graham for sharing his insights to everyone listening. Thank you for listening as always. And if you've got anything you want to ask me, if you want to join me on this podcast, whatever it is, please don't passively listen. Send me a message. Say, Neil, I'm a long time listener, first time caller, first time emailer, whatever it is. I genuinely want to connect with you all and have those conversations with you. 
either on a direct message, an email, an audio message, or on a show floor at a tech conference. And I do get to come to a lot. So if I am coming to a tech conference near you, hook me up. We'll have a hot coffee or a cold beer, whichever is easiest for you. But that's it for today. So thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you.